Welcome to our listeners and to our viewers. Uh, I'm Joseph Weiler, the editor-in-chief of EGIL. Uh, EGIL is not just the European Journal of International Law. It's an academic and intellectual community. And it's fueled, of course, by the journal, but it has also been fueled in recent years by our blog, EGIL Talk, which accompanies the journal. And recently, we've introduced a new feature to the sense of the EGIL community, which is EGIL Live, which combines both a podcast and some features on YouTube. Uh, we like to have a fresh, or our plan is to have a fresh issue of EGIL Live to accompany each new issue of the journal as it appears, although not only that. And as part of the EGIL Live, we plan an in-depth discussion with the authors of the article appearing in the issue of the journal, which accompanies the podcast and the YouTube. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Tillman Atvika and Oliver Diggleman, who will be publishing in the second issue of EGIL for 2014, an article called, How is Progress Constructed in International Legal Scholarship? Welcome. So this is an article about progress in international law, but it's not really about progress in international law, it's about the writing about progress in international law. So it's almost a sort of sociological inquiry. How and why do authors write about progress in international law? So my first question, and you, first question, and you can take your pick who will answer, is how did you get to this? Because normally we would expect an article about progress, you write about progress, but you are writing about the writing about progress. Well, actually, we were invited to a conference to speak about um, um, global constitutionalism. And, global, um, constitutionalism. global constitutionalism. It's a and very, very specific topic. It's a very specific topic. <laughs> um, a lot of people wrote and thought about it. And um, in the course of our preparation, we, we started wondering um, why are people so interested in this topic? There's, there's a number of reasons, um, and one of them is they want to, to take part in, the, in the, they want to tell us a story of success of international law. Um, a story, um, a progress, they want to work on a progress narrative. This was, is uh, one reason why we stumbled over the topic. Another one is that I wrote an article some years ago on periodization of the historiography of international law. And there I realized that the way um, international legal scholar periodize is often driven by the ambition also to tell a story of success about international law. So, so from period to period, it gets better. This is the essence, yes. You sort of go from the Stone Age to the Iron Age to the Internet Age. I'm teasing. Yeah, you're, you, you have these um, this, uh, dualisms, modern, uh, classical, modern international law, um, old new order, um, new world order. Um, there's, there's a lot we could, uh, we could tell about that. Yeah. And how, tell us, how was the exercise of working together? The, well, we publish, it's quite common to have, to have uh, articles published by two persons. Very often it's written by the assistant and signed by the professor, but this is mm -hmm. not the case here. No. So how, how was the exercise of working together? How did you do it? Well, actually, we met a while ago and we have a long-standing uh, relationship of writing together. And, and what we do is that we decide who comes up with the first draft and uh, then actually it's uh, the second one uh, starting anew, uh, thinking about it. Um, and we circulate the drafts <clears throat> uh, uh, all the time. So it's actually, you, you couldn't tell which part uh, he wrote, which part I wrote. It's, um, um, it's, uh, it's an interchange I, that's I've ongoing. I've done a lot of uh, arbitration and usually it's one of the arbitrators who sort of writes the master text and the other's input. Mm -hmm. Is it one of you who wrote the master text? 
No, that's not the case. Actually, we really, first we discuss the main ideas. Sure. And uh, then we, we write parts of the text. And then so you divided the work. You write this part, I write that part, and then we sort of stitch them together and edit them? It's, it's difficult to say. There is no general rule. But, but in we, this article? Um, in this article, um, we, we took the basic text of our, um, of our presentation at this conference in Budapest, and then we continued, and we, um, we were discussing each sentence of the text together because uh, the whole is more than the two pieces. And uh, you must find this a rewarding experience. Definitely, yeah. Uh, as you said, the whole is more than the, the two pieces. And uh, as, uh, as we said, uh, we change from the very specific topic of global constitution constitutionalism because in, in the way uh, we dealt with it, we suddenly realized that the really interesting topic was actually something different and more general. And this is an ongoing process um, that we, we've been talking uh, scientifically with each other for a long time, and, and this is the way we work. Let's reserve for later, if we have time, your thoughts of why global constitutionalism is considered progress. Because you don't actually go into the merits uh, the content of progress, it's more the technique about writing and presenting it, etc. And we will get to that also, uh, we will get to that also in a moment. But here's something curious that I found in reading your article. So you say, and you explained now also to the listeners and viewers, that you suddenly had this insight that the fascination was global constitutionalism was people wanting to present international law is successful, and then you couple that with periodization, so it's not just currently successful, but there's a trend of progress. But you never actually explain why they want to, why they want to present it as successful, why they want to present it as a story of progress. After all, in other fields of law, you get a lot of points for being very critical. We have the whole critical tradition which says it's a sham, we unmask, it's a game of power. And yet, so you don't, you very quickly, after that basic insight, you show us how the process of writing about and constructing progress is done, but you don't speculate what is the motivation behind it. So maybe speculate now. Why do you think international lawyers are motivated to tell a story of progress and to tell a story of success? To put it very briefly, I would say that in the end, it's, it's a search for orientation in the end in a secular world. And this is why the people try to tell a story of success because they, they need orientation. And this is why progress still plays such an important role even after the history of the 20th century. It's, it fills, in a way, um, as we described it, a sort of gap of orientation. And it's to, for that thesis to hold, and I'm not saying that it doesn't hold, it requires a certain identification of scholars with their field, so that in some way the success of the field gives orientation to the scholar, if I understand you correctly. But as I say, in other fields, including other fields of law, and maybe some people will contest you and say you're reading the map wrongly, but let's leave that aside. People find great satisfaction in deconstructing a field, in showing that it actually doesn't achieve its goals, that criminal law, the writing about American criminal law is a writing about failure. The predominant mode, this is a field that failed. American criminal law does not do any of the jobs that criminal law is meant to do. So what is particular about international law, which according to your thesis, the actual scholarly community which writes in this progr progress way and success way is invested in the success of the field? Maybe you could also point to the way that international legal theory has developed over the last, I would say, 20 years. As you said, we had the, the critical approaches and the, the immense uh, value that the critical approaches brought to the discourse, but you always were left with the feeling that 
um, in the end, uh, the negative um, side <coughs> to uh, scholarly inquiry cannot be all. You have to make um, you have to make positive. You have to find positive answers, really. And maybe uh, global constitutionalism is a way to give positive answers. And it was, you know, in a way, a reaction to what was before. And and, and that you might, may call it progress, but at least it was a development within the field of international legal theory. Is it possible that international law? attracts people, even as young men and women, who have a kind of idealist streak. And international law is a field, they think, that can find realization of making the world a better place. Uh, it, is it possible that there's a self-selection ongoing there? Definitely. Uh, self-selection is, I think, um, the right way to put it. Um, and it's actually, in, in our article, we had the feeling that um, uh, progress is the idea that we can we can actually make progress. It's something that you can do, and each individual uh, academic can participate in and, and facilitate. So now I'm going to ask you a question that I think many of your readers and many of the people listening or watching this interview might want me to ask is, how far are you willing to generalize the phenomenon? Uh, because you explain the genealogy of it. You thought that the enthusiasm for global constitutionalism, and you're right, it's a big growth field and there's a journal of con global constitutional law, etc. that it had a, one explanation was that here was a way of describing success. And then you went and researched the phenomenology. So how is progress constructed? But do you have any empirical intuition of how widespread is it? Are you describing a central phenomenon, something which is epiphenomenal, something which is, there's a subgroup? How representative is the literature of progress and uh, international law success as part of the general literature of international law, in your view? Um. Our empirical research um, showed that, I would say, most authors um, are, um, they have this, in a way, this optimistic spirit or this pressure to tell a story of success. Of course, there are other, there are other authors. Um, there's also, there are also the bad stories, uh, the, the stories of failures, but they are um, rather um, a minority. Um, I, w I would say. And but, you did but, this research in a systematic way? You took a sample or was it...? It was not systematic research, but we, we looked at the literature we had, um, uh, which was available and tried to get an impression. What is the overall atmosphere in this literature? So you looked at the main journals? Main and journals, um, 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 yeah. What, just guesstimating, and I don't want to put you on the stop, what was your sample size, more or less? 500 articles, 200 articles, 1,000 articles? <laughs> no, not so much. 100 or 150. 150, like over a period yeah. of... Mm -hmm. but, but let me come back to a question you asked before. You were asking, why does it play such an important role? And I think, um, um, as Tillman said, um, a lot of idealistic people are attracted to the discipline. And it's also, it's the insight that we cannot afford a failure of international law. This is, of course, this, is, this has, a, has a big influence on, on the way we approach the question of progress. But you, it's a very interesting statement about the scholars and it's just to, yeah. to bring this out because in some way then I mean, some ideas of the scientist is that the scientist in some way has a distance from the object of research and tries to analyze it in a dispassionate way and is not normatively biased, etc. And here you are describing something very different. You're describing people who are scientists of international law and at the same time they are leading the cheerleading, the cheerleaders. Uh, we have to success, we cannot fail. This kind of we is very interesting. Yes, definitely. Uh, so we, we are not saying that they are not right. There may be progress, but we are agnostic about Correct. whether there is real progress. What we want to do is look but at you're the making a, What I was trying to say is <clears throat> you're making 
a kind of statement and you say that you are willing to stand behind the empirical statement that this is a prevalent feature of international legal scholarship, you are making a statement of the type of scholar that we are facing, a scholar who is engaged in his or her in the venture. It's not just I am being analytical, I am being etc., but I want this project to succeed. Yes. Yes. I think there is a And it's not necessarily the case in all other fields of law. There's something not necessarily no. Probably something specific in our in our discipline. There is probably a sort of bias in a sense. You know, I edit Egil and Icon. So I was thinking if my experience of editing Egil, and it's not just what we publish, it's the hundreds and hundreds of articles that we see that are submitted, I could uh, support this notion that it's a generally optimistic uh, scholarship, etc. And I haven't r reached a conclusion. But with ICON, people writing in other areas of public law, like constitutional law, like administrative law, I would say that is not the case. Usually the mm -hmm. tone of the articles is why courts get it wrong and why mm -hmm. this is a terrible decision and mm -hmm. why they don't understand, etc. Mm -hmm. So there's, if you are right, there's a very interesting distinction between these areas of public law. The constitutional and administrative lawyers are more often than not critical and telling a story not of failure, but at least of partial failure or very limited, the limitations of the field, whereas according to you, the international lawyers are pushing a story of progress and success. I mean, there is this typical international law article um, which has, uh, is entitled From um, Particleism to Universalism, or uh, some, somebody who describes a paradigm shift and the successful paradigm is always, always then the, the, newer, uh, the newer one. This is, a, this is the typical spirit of international law articles. So as I said, I am thinking about this. I'm also thinking if that's the kind of impression you would get from reading, reading Egil, which might show that we have an editorial bias <laughs> in publishing that kind of piece. <laughs> But uh, let's, uh, let's uh, wait and see, uh, think about that. So before we get into uh, uh, some of the specific arguments of the phenomenology, uh, you say you employ a constructivist method as your principal methodology. And constructivism has become one of those terms that are used very loosely. So what I would like you to tell us, what's the form, what's the kind of constructivism that is the methodology that you employ here? Because it means so many things to so many different people. So, so mm -hmm. um, okay, we are, we are strongly influenced um, actually by um, the writings of the 1960s by uh, Berger and Luckmann. And um, this is probably, this is the basic text and has been further developed. And our, our, essential conviction is really that um, the, the social reality we, we inhabit uh, is furnished in a way, is furnished by um, inter, intersubjective, um, commonly shared intersubjective knowledge, which has a privileged status. Yeah? This, is, um, this is the basic idea of social constructivism. And um, we are convinced that this is a, um, this is a, um, a very open view to understand um, how the world, the social world, functions. It's a, it's a, it's a methodology which... And, and the social world that you describe here is what? The world of international legal scholars? The world of international well, it's, it's, legal it's, scholars it's, it's and practitioners? the whole practice. social world. International law, world of international law is part, um, is part of, the, of the whole social world. It's, I know, but in, in this case, and if I misunderstand you, correct me, but in this case, you use constructivism to explain as an agent this writing about progress, this investment in progress. Mm -hmm. But we, we don't have a writing about progress and success in all other fields of scientific inquiry or in, even in all other fields of law. So it, the universe you're looking in, which you are employing the constructivist method, mm -hmm. must be the world of international legal mm -hmm. scholarship. For constructivism to work, again, correct me if I'm wrong, there actually has to be some kind of social interaction and social networking and this mutual influence and 
this reference group and peer group. How does that work in the world of international legal scholarship? You really see that kind of uh, the sufficient thickness of cohesion for constructivism to work? Well, maybe that might be a problem because what we see is that our discipline of international law is maybe a bit too close, too isolated from from, from uh, other uh, discourses. And that might be one explanation why political scientists sometimes have a problem to accept what we are doing because we seem to be talking, uh, writing in a different uh, language. So maybe the interaction is too, uh, too little. The interaction beyond the field, but I want to repeat my question. For constructivism to work as an explanatory mechanism for the phenomenon you describe, this writing about progress and all the rest, there has to be a certain thickness to the community, which then constructivism shows you see there's this mutual reinforcement, etc., etc. Is the world of international legal scholarship, has it got that sufficient thickness for constructivism to work? You could say they see each other in conferences, etc. I, I just want to understand because for constructivism to work as a methodology, you're saying it's a mutually reinforcing, etc. There has to be a certain thickness to the community, otherwise constructivism doesn't work. There has to be a certain consistency of interaction, of uh, interlocutorship, of intercourse. I mean, what the international legal discourse does, there, there is a competition of ways to describe the international world and the, the role of law in it. And this, this competition is a competition of ways to to furnish the world with a certain knowledge. Yeah. If we, um, we brought the example of the uni um, universalism of human rights. Yeah. Um, um, does it have the status of a, of a social truth that uh, human rights are universal? This is a competition of, of views, and, and one of them um, wins and another, another loses. So this is why we, we find the, the whole approach uh, very helpful. Because but, and you say, for example, in this case, or, or more gener gener generically to your article, that if you adopt a story of success, if you tell a story of progress, in this competition, your view will win. Not necessarily. So explain to us. <clears throat> I thought your co-author hinted in that direction. Um. <clears throat> because then it becomes that it reinforces, it invites, it, it explains what you are describing not as a discrete set of parallel phenomena, but actually of a trend, a, a field description. Well, of course, the field of international law is diverse and you have different, uh, um, um, uh, you have different uh, voices in it and you have practitioners, you have academics all, take, all taking part in the international legal discourse. You have different regions of the world leading uh, and engaged in different uh, uh, conversations. Um, so I, I wouldn't assume that if you, if, you, if you tell a story of progress, it's necessarily <clears throat> accepted all over the world. The word. Not all over. Look, I don't, you are not claiming, and I don't think I or the readers would understand that you are making a story of homogeneity. But you are making a story of dominance. That's why I asked my previous question. You say this is a dominant approach. This is a dominant feature of the literature. That was the sense of my previous question. And now we're trying to understand how it becomes dominant. Mm -hmm. So the method you use is constructivism. And we're trying to flesh out, so what is the insight that constructivism gives us in order to understand why the, a story of success or a story of progress, it's not homogeneous, but becomes dominant. And one explanation was because there's a competition for explanations of the world we see, and then now I'm insisting and I'm asking, so in your view, is the constructivist uh, insight that if you tell a story of success and you tell a story of progress, you are more likely that your view will come to prevail in the, in the community of international lawyers. Is there tension between the yeah. two of you? That's actually not what we are saying. So no. explain to us better. We are just using the constructivist 
um, approach in order to describe what is going on, what, what, what is going on when these views compete, yeah. that the, the agents are trying to establish a certain perception of the, the, the reality of international law. This is what we are saying. I understand, and if I misunderstood, I apologize to you, to the <laughs> listeners, to the viewers. But what part of the thing that I, I'm trying to do in the interview is to fill in some of the gaps, to ask you some of the questions yeah. that people reading the article, and I read it with care, will be asking you. So there's a little, there's a causality gap, because you make the empirical claim that this is not a discrete phenomenon, this is actually a widespread phenomenon and maybe even the dominant phenomenon. And what I'm trying to understand, it's not to challenge the description. The jury is out. Your readers will decide themselves. But what I'm trying to understand now, how it becomes so. So we answered before why it becomes so, because you gave this offer, it gives orientation, etc. And now we try to understand from a social science point of view, so how does it become so? Because there has to be some explanation because there are other views, so why is one view prevailing rather? And I thought that the method, it's not just a descriptive method. Constructivism also has a certain causality. It's got an explanatory, it's an explanatory apparatus, not just a descriptive apparatus. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Mm -hmm. The way you use constructivism to explain the success of the success story narrative of the progress narrative. So, just take my question as a question that a reader of this very interesting article, and the fact that we're holding the interview suggests that at least the editorial board of EGIL thinks it's a very interesting article. So what's the explanatory apparatus of constructivism to explain the success of the success story? I'm not sure whether I have a clear answer to that question. I think I would have, would have to, to think about it longer. Okay, that's good enough.